Good day, friends, and welcome to today's session as we study the book of Daniel. Today we will look at chapter 4. This is a unique chapter in the Bible because it's an official autobiographical document prepared by the king of Babylon and distributed throughout his vast empire. That Nebuchadnezzar should openly admit to his pride, his temporary insanity, and to all that he had done and to his evil behavior, and then give glory to the God of Israel? Okay, let's... Daniel Bible Study, Part 4, Learning the Hard Way. Introduction. Good day, friends, and welcome to today's uh, session as we continue our study in the book of Daniel. Today we will look at Daniel chapter 4. This is a unique chapter in the Bible because it's an official autobiographical document that Nebuchadnezzar prepared and distributed throughout his vast empire that Nebuchadnezzar should openly admit his pride, his temporary insanity, his beastly behavior, and then give glory to the God of Israel for his recovery, well, that's indeed a miracle in and of itself. Two lessons that are important to learn from this chapter. First of all, how we have to learn the hard way. Proverbs reminds us pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall in Proverbs 16, 18. But the grand lesson that God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to learn and for us to remember is that God alone is sovereign and will not permit any person to usurp his throne or take credit for anything he has done. Why is it that a person who has experienced the goodness of God turns away from God and thus experiences judgment, can all of a sudden receive the mercy and grace of God? Because God does not weary in showing mercy. Oh yes, he sends judgment, he humbles the proud, he punishes sin. But he does it all because he desires to see, uh, how, see us see sin as he sees us, so we would return to him. One particular episode in the life of Nebuchadnezzar reveals how God works in the cycle of redemption in the lives of both the great and the obscure. This chapter starts off with Nebuchadnezzar giving praise to God in verses 1 to 3. Let's read it together. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and people of every nation, language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. God has done a lot in the life of the king. It's approximately 20 years since uh, chapter, the events of chapter 3 in the fiery furnace. During this time, something incredible has happened in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar to humble him and to acknowledge that God is the supreme king of all the universe. But what happened to bring the king to this realization? Well, he had a dream. Now, in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him, but this time, the dream he experiences terrifies him. In verse 4, he writes, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. Then the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came. I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him my dream. 
He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a a tree in the middle of the land. His height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I I saw while lying in bed, I, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from under its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground and in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the uh, plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by the messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and drives them and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them and sets over them the lowliest of the people. This is the dream that I, Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. This time, the dream is of a tree that grows and becomes large. It encompasses the whole earth. An angel then comes, commands the tree to be cut down with only the stump remaining, and the stump is surrounded by a middle bound. Next, the image changes, and starting in verse 15, the stump is clearly revealed to be a man who becomes more like an animal, and in verse 17, it reveals that the cause of of this is arrogance and pride. It's being done so that the man will know that it is God and not himself who is the power of, of, uh, and has authority. Daniel tells the dream some disturbing facts. The dream refers to Nebuchadnezzar. And we read that Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time and his thoughts terrified him. The king said to Belteshazzar, Do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals and having nesting places and its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass in the field as while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by him. This is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from the people and live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. 
The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sin by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. This dream is indeed a warning that because of his arrogance, God is about to humble Nebuchadnezzar. For seven years, madness would overtake him and he would live like a beast in the field. What is significant in this section is verse 27. Break away from sin by doing righteousness, Daniel tells the king. He's saying it's not too late. He could avoid the dream's predictions if he would repent and act righteously. The king is given a year before the fulfillment of the dream. Then one day he boasts arrogantly of the magnificence of his city, and all this happens to the king Nebuchadnezzar. In verse 29, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence of my mighty power for the glory of my majesty. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from the people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox, his body drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like feathers like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. The dream was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar went from being king of the most powerful nation on earth to being barely more than an animal in the field. Nebuchadnezzar was suffering from a form of mental illness called boanthropy, where someone is convinced they're an ox or some kind of a cow or a bull. And the purpose of this punishment was to humble him, to show him who was really in charge. It was also to show what sin does. It dehumanizes. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar lived like an animal, Then after the time that God appointed, it says that the king raised his eyes to heaven, which is a form of prayer. And the magnificent result was God's mercy and restoration. In verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. The king is longing for God to deliver him, and God does exactly that. He restores the king's mind and place. Nebuchadnezzar demonstrates that he has learned his lesson, and he begins to praise God. God not only restored his mind, but returned him to a place of authority and power. And once he realized the true source of his strength, 
he was able to be trusted again with power. In all of this, what can we learn from the way that God dealt with the king? It's sometimes too easy to say that God is the God, the God of the Old Testament is a God of judgment. When we see stories like this, we see his judgment. But when we look carefully and closely, we discern that the judgment is also part of a larger cycle of redemption. God's judgment has a purpose, and part of his plan is to draw us back to himself. So what is the larger picture? Well, This story reveals at least five things that God gave Nebuchadnezzar. Number one, God gives warnings. He doesn't smack Nebuchadnezzar out of the blue. He sends a dream to let him know what is about to come. And then he sends Daniel to help him realize what the dream means. There are enough indicators to reveal that Nebuchadnezzar knew what God was going to do and why he was going to do it. God's warnings are always an act of love. He desires that all people should repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. Today, we are so worried about sounding negative or judgmental that there is a danger of us being unloving by not being sufficiently bold in warning people of the dangers ahead. With the warning God gives, he he also gives an opportunity to repent. What is even more amazing was that the plan could have been changed. In verse 27, Daniel advises the king that it's not too late to turn back from the path he has taken. Not only that, but God waits a full year before he follows through on the dream. Scripture teaches us that God is patient with us. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, says Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance in 2 Peter 3, 9. And Paul testifies, God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. 1 Timothy 1.16 Yes, God is patient. He's slow to anger. He's long-suffering. It's never too late to return to God. But understand that God does follow through on his word. He gives judgment. No, he's not doing this to be a bully or to vent his anger, no. The The biblical picture is that God's judgment is always acted out to draw us to repentance. In chapter four of the book of Amos, there is a list of calamities that God sent to the people of Israel. Each one followed by a repeated refrain, that you have not returned to me, says the Lord. And all of this is followed in verse 6. See the Lord that you may live. (laughs) The book of Haggai similarly points to God working judgment to make us aware of the destruction of sin and our need for God. In fact, Haggai 1.7 says, consider your ways. And then in 2.19, he says, yet from this day, I will bless you. Why the difference? Because God is calling us to repentance. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But it also goes on to say that God sent his Son into the world, not to judge it, but to save the world through him. You see, God's judgment is not vindictive. He is not trying to get back at us. He's not, he is trying to restore us to life and keep us off the path that leads to destruction and death. Oh, he doesn't stay angry, but he shows his mercy. He gives mercy to Nebuchadnezzar. And like grace, mercy is one of those church words that we sometimes do not have a good job defining. But to put it simply, mercy is not getting a bad thing we do deserve. Grace is the opposite. Grace is getting a good thing we do not deserve. And God chose Nebuchadnezzar mercy. 
He has what he deserves. He's getting what he should get. And God gives him what he does not deserve, just like us. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then God gives restoration. Sometimes we believe that God's judgment is a part of his love. Maybe we believe that God is merciful. But true restoration is something that never bothers to enter many of our minds. You can pull the nail out of a board, but there will always be a hole in it. You can glue something back together, but you will always see the crack. I think we often think of God this way. Though he might forgive us and take us back, he still looks down on us because we've messed up and we think he's assigned us to lesser roles because we think we're not worthy. In short, we believe that even when God forgives, he's sort of passively, aggressively punishing us for our past sins. But it's important to realize this is not what the Bible says. Romans 8, 1 reminds, tells us, there is now, say that with me, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God restored Nebuchadnezzar not just as, to his humanity, but to his place of power and position. In fact, God increased his authority so that he was greater at the end than his beginning. It's easy to think of redemption as the ultimate end, but restoration means that there is more to redemption than the promise of eternal life. He has something for us right now. The lives of the redeemed are good. God restores our purpose here on earth. God's restored people are called to bear fruit of every good work and the increase of God's knowledge. You see, God does not just release us from the prison of our own sin, but he restores us to a place of service where he will use us. Just like in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son, when the son came back to the father, he expected rejection. He expected to be put into slavery. But what does the father do? He restores him back to sonship. And that's what God wants to do to you for you today. Maybe you have fallen back. Maybe you have, uh, we call it backslidden. Maybe you have fallen away. But God is calling you back to himself. Don't remain in this place uh, anymore. But be released of your chains and turn to him. He wants to forgive you. He wants to restore you. If you've enjoyed this today, I I invite you to take the the questions that are in the chat and go over them yourself, or even better, bring some friends together and share this video and and this teaching and and, and talk about the video and, and what God's Word has to say and share these lessons today. I trust that today, if you need to be forgiven, you know you can come to him. He loves you that much. Would you give your life to him today? We would love to be able to help you. You can connect with us at hcfsydney.ca. Ask for Pastor Ralph or Pastor Sue, and we'd be happy to connect with you and help you on your walk of faith. God bless, and we'll see you again next time.